I just want to mention quickly that um, at 12 o'clock today uh, in Crockett, there's a, a celebration of the life of Sister Adrian put together by the family. We have been invited, and there are some people from the church who intend to go, if this is something that is of interest to you. Talk to either Sister Gwen or Brother Kenny, and they can give you more information. We, we were invited. I won't be able to be there because we have that second service. But if you'd like to be there, pay uh, respects uh, to her uh, life, uh, her memory, uh, you can do that as well. All right, let's turn our attention to the Bible, and we are in the book of Ezra today. Last Sunday, we finished uh, 2 Kings, and uh, 2 Kings is followed by 1 and 2 Chronicles. We are going to skip 1 and 2 Chronicles, and here's why. Um, the truths of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings are repeated in First and Second Chronicles. First and Second Chronicles are a review of First Samuel through Second Kings. It, First and Second Chronicles were written later, so it, there's a slight, uh, uh, there's a difference in perspective. First and Second Kings tells the story of the kings from a more immediate point of view. First and Second Chronicles is, is further removed, and there are some distinctions in the in the accounts. Uh, for instance, the account of David's life. Their emphasis are are put in different places. When I say distinctions, not the they tell different stories, but that they emphasize different things. So the book of First and Second Chronicles is well worth the the reading and the investment. It's a, it's a great book, but again. Because we've already covered First and Second Kings extensively, we're going to skip First and Second Chronicles, and we're in Ezra right now. As imperfect human beings, full of limitations, and I know that describes your neighbor, perhaps not you. As imperfect human beings, full of limitations, we don't always get things right the first time, do we? We often need second chances. And here's the good news. God often allows for second chances. And that's one of the messages of the book of Ezra. One of the messages of the book of Ezra is that God allows you turns. In the highway of life, God gives second chances. Thank God for that. All right. The year is 605 before Christ. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon has invaded Jerusalem, invaded Israel. And he begins to take people captive to the land of Babylon, a 900-mile trip. And they go as captives, as slaves to Babylon. And there they will live, um, not necessarily as slaves, but as, as indentured servants or um, people with work permits but not citizens, something like that. So anyways... It, this begins in, in 605 before Christ. It will happen again in 598, and it will happen one third and final time in 586 before Christ, uh, before Christ. So three times, Nebuchadnezzar and his armies will come and take people from Israel to Babylon. The third time was the worst because by then he was fed up with the Jews because they kept revolting. They kept uh, um, refusing to pay taxes to Babylon. So the third time when he comes, he just destroys the city, levels the city, burns everything, kills um, uh, most of the people who were there. And it is the final destruction of Jerusalem. So in 586, Jerusalem is, is, is no more. And the people are taken to, to Babylon. Now, they will settle in Babylon, and Babylon is what, old Babylon is today where we, we the country would call um, Iran, uh, excuse me, Iraq. Babylon was the powerhouse of the time. Iraq was the, the, the biggest and baddest uh, uh, empire at the time when this happened. So, um, they get there, and they begin to assimilate the culture and, and, and get involved in what's going on and so on and so forth. And they go from being shepherds in Israel to being shopkeepers in Babylon. They go from being farmers in Israel to being financiers in Babylon. 
And because they have the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in them, God will prosper them even in Babylon. Even as indentured servants, they will still be blessed. As a matter of fact, they will prosper in Babylon. And 70 years later, they are pretty much settled in. But God had a different plan for them. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the heart, the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put, in it, put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now let's pause there for just a second and look at this verse. Because there are a couple of things I want to mention to you just in passing. Notice that no, it's no longer Nebuchadnezzar. It is now Cyrus. And it's no longer the king of Babylon, but he is the king of Persia. Persia is today's Iran. And so what happened is that Iraq was the dominant power. And then Persia became stronger and stronger and stronger and took over. Iran took over Iraq. And uh, over the course of these 70 years, there were five different kings. You know, kings die, they move on and so on, uh, are deposed. So there were five different kings. But 70, year later, 70 years later, we have now Cyrus. And he is the, the, ru the ruler of, of the empire now, the, the Persian empire. And the Persian Empire has taken over the Babylonian Empire. So, now notice something else here that's interesting. The Bible says that God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. Cyrus is a pagan king. He's not a God-fearing man. But God stirs up his spirit so that his word might be fulfilled and his purpose, pur purposes may be accomplished. The Bible says specifically that God had, had spoken through a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, had prophesied before they were taken captives. He said, God's going to come and he's gonna, he has pronounced judgment against us. And the city is going to be destroyed and we're going to be taken into captivity. But 70 years later, God's bringing us back. So 70 years go by and sure enough, it's time for the prophecy to be fulfilled. And God stirs up the heart, the spirit of Cyrus and Cyrus sends them back to Jerusalem. Now, a lot of things happen behind the scenes in order for this prophecy to be fulfilled. And we will talk about it when we come to the book of Daniel. So I'll save that for, for uh, our study of Daniel. But suffice to say that Cyrus, a pagan king, was, was touched by the Holy Spirit so as to do the will of God and to bring about the purposes of God for his people. By the way, one more interesting thing about Cyrus... Um, history has a lot to say about Cyrus. He was a great, uh, great military leader, a great political leader. Uh, secular history has a lot to say about him. But there's an interesting episode that one, uh, uh, a Jewish historian tells us about. His name was Josephus. And he says, uh, well, let me take one step back and, and, and share something else with you. And we'll see this when we come to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah lived roughly about 150 years before the fall of Jerusalem. And Isaiah, 150 years before the fall of Jerusalem, was already prophesying, if we don't change our ways, if we don't repent, if we don't come back to God, things are going to go bad for us. And God will send judgment on our nation. And the people wouldn't listen. And the prophecy started, to get, to get, started getting more and more specific. So Isaiah specifically said, God is going to bring a, a kingdom from the north. Uh, from the east, excuse me. And they are going to take us into captivity. And then God will bring us back again. And listen to this. 150 years before Cyrus, God uses Isaiah to prophesy specifically that a leader would, would rise from the east. And his name would be Cyrus. And he would send the people back to Jerusalem. Fast forward 150 years. And Cyrus is on a rampage and he's just taking over kingdoms and taking over countries and, and conquering people and conquering people. And he comes to Jerusalem and he's about to conquer uh, Jerusalem. And the priests, of, uh, the priests in Jerusalem 
take the scroll of the book of, of Isaiah and show it to him. And they point out to him, here's your name on a prophecy 150 years old. God's saying that you're going to come here and that you're going to do all the stuff that you're doing. So Cyrus, a pagan king, understood there's something to this God of Israel. This guy, this God knew me by name 150 years ago. Wow. Cyrus was impressed by the prophecy. And as a result, A, he did not destroy the city any further. And number two, as you can see, he was kind to, um, to the Jews and allowed them to, uh, to return. So uh, this is a very interesting uh, time in history at a very interesting time in, the, um, in prophecy. There's all kinds of prophecies and good stuff happening. What time is it? It's 538 before Christ. 538 before Christ. Um, now, note, remember, verse 1 said that all this happened, that the word of Isaiah, excuse me, the word of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. What word is that? Jeremiah 29.10 says this, For thus says the Lord, this is Jeremiah prophesying, Thus says the Lord, After 70 years are completed at, ba uh, at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you, and cause you to return to this place. This is what God said through Jeremiah before the fall of Jerusalem. So before 605. The city fell for the first time in 605. 70 years from 605 would be 535. The edict the, or, or the, 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 the order by the king comes out in 538. And it takes them about a year to get ready to go back. They do go back. It takes them another year and a half, two years to start rebuilding the temple. In 535, they start rebuilding the temple. And that's when the clock closes. That's the 70 years are fulfilled. So from 605 to 535, the temple had, was destroyed. In 535, it begins to be rebuilt. And that's the 70 years. Now, just for you to appreciate the trip that they're taking. This is a 900 mile trip over rough terrain at times. It's a long road. It's like going from San Francisco to Los Angeles and back. And you're walking. And you're walking and you're with animals and, and older people and, and, and little kids and, and, and so on. And, and you're moving. So, you know, you're, you're carrying your, your luggage and, and furniture and whatever else you're carrying with you. Uh, some places were dangerous, some parts of the road. These are not paved roads mostly, by the way. Um, and, and even where, um, and in most places... Uh, in many places, it would be quite dangerous to be traveling. So this was a, a, a huge undertaking. And it would take him about four months to complete this trip. But that's what God called him to do. Now remember, there's a challenge here because by now, 70 years later, they've become accustomed to life in Babylon. And they've prospered. They're doing well in Babylon. So there may have been a temptation in their hearts to maybe stay there. But God, the same God who stirred the heart of Cyrus, stirred the heart of his people for them to return to their homeland. And, and several of them did. There were about 50,000 of them that did. Ezra uh, Chronicles, chapter 2 of Ezra, by the way, chronicles the people who returned. They were led by a civil leader by the name of Zerubbabel. The Bible tells us about him in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now these are the people of the province who came back from captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. I'm in Ezra chapter 2, now verse 2. Those who came with Zerubbabel were, and then it begins to list them. In chapter 2 is a long list of names and numbers. Numbers of people followed, uh, who followed their leaders back to Israel. And it comes out to about 50,000 people. 50,000 people that took this uh, journey back. And they come back to Jerusalem. Imagine their shock when they arrive. The city is in ruins. Everything has been leveled. Walls are down. The temple had been completely destroyed. So they settled back in Jerusalem and their neighboring cities, but the country was in complete shambles. There was nothing there. They would have to start rebuilding from scratch. Now, 
One of their leaders, as we already mentioned, was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was a civil leader. But there was also another leader, a spiritual leader, by the name of Jeshua. Jeshua, or in some translation, uh, uh, Jeshua, uh, a priest. He was a descendant of Aaron. And he challenged the people to build the, al the altar of God. Chapter 3, verses one, and 1, 2, and 3. Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And when the seventh month had come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. So the first thing that they decided to do was to rebuild the altar so that they could worship God. A place of encounter with God, a place to offer God sacrifices, a place of worship. That's the first thing they did. And I'm glad they did, because they're teaching us something here. They're teaching us the importance of, this is how we build our lives. It begins with an altar. It begins with a place of worship. It begins with a place of encounter with God. You might think that they would begin with the walls. You might expect that maybe they would first build the walls so they can... <coughs> They would first rebuild the walls so they would have some security. And then from the walls, maybe build the houses so they, they have a roof over their, their heads. And then from the houses, rebuild the church, rebuild the, the altar. But no. Led by uh, Jeshua, they said, we need to be, before we do anything else, we need to rebuild the altar. We need a place of worship. We need a place of encounter. And we need a place to make a sacrifice to our God. Our walk with God begins with sacrifice. Jesus said, unless you're willing to die to self and carry your cross, you're not worthy of me. A walk with God begins with sacrifice. It begins with surrender. It begin, begins with bringing everything you are and everything you have and surrendering it to God. Everything flows from that and that's what they're teaching us. They begun by rebuilding the altar. That's the first thing they did. And then from the altar, they're going to rebuild the temple around it. And then after the temple, they're going to rebuild the walls. So in God's scheme of things, it begins with worship and sacrifice and goes from there. We are tempted to build from the outside in. God says, no, we begin on the inside and move out. They rebuilt the altar and they started bringing offerings and sacrifices to God and worshiping in the morning and in the evening. And then they followed that up with building the temple. Together... Zerubbabel and Jeshua led the people to begin rebuilding the temple. That's in verse 8. Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem. So this would be right around 335 uh, before Christ. Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of captivity to Jerusalem, begun work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Verse 9, Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers, and Kadiel with his sons and the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God. I'm going to go down to verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever towards Israel. They sang responsively, meaning that the priests would say, The Lord is good. And the people would say, and his mercies endure forever. The Lord is good, and his mercies endure forever. And they shouted that, and the trumpets played. And they celebrated the, the beginning of the, of the construction of the, of the new temple. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. They laid down the foundation and they celebrated. And so begun 
the, uh, the reconstruction of the temple that had been destroyed 70 years earlier. All is well so far, right? But there was opposition. There was opposition. That's chapter 4. Now, verse four, chapter 4, verse 1. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers of the fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God even as you do. Notice verse 1 and 2. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard, they came. When the adversaries, when the enemies heard, they came. When God begins to move, the enemy hears and he comes. When things begin to happen in your life, good things, God starts stirring you up and moving in your life and directing you and speaking to you. Get ready because the enemy will hear of it and he will counterattack. The enemy has very limited resources, unlike God who owns everything and is everywhere and can do all things. The enemy has limited resources and he will deploy that resource, those resources where they can count the most. So if God is not moving in your life and you're not moving in the kingdom, well, the enemy is not going to waste his efforts on you because frankly, you're no threat to him. But the moment you get involved, you start reading your Bibles, you start coming to Monday night prayer, you start coming early for service, you start volunteering, you start telling your neighbors about Jesus, you start supporting the ministry, you're supporting missions, you're getting involved in evangelism, you're praying, you're fasting, you're getting involved in the kingdom, you become a threat to the enemy. And listen to what the Bible says, the enemy heard and came. When the enemy hears that God is at work in your life, when the, the enemy hears you worshiping, when the enemy hears you praying, when the enemy hears you fellowshipping with other believers, he comes to oppose the work of, of the Lord in your life. But what might surprise you here is the fact of how he came and what he did. And we'll get to that in a second. But by the way, this verse reminds me of 1 Corinthians 16.8 where Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, and he's telling them, oh, by the way, I'm going to come and visit you. Paul had planted a church in Corinth, and he had moved on in his missions, but now he was writing back to them and saying, I'm going to come back and visit you guys. But before I go, I need to spend some more time in Ephesus. He says in verse 9, for a great and effective door has opened to me. He says, there are good things happening right here where, I'm, where I am, so I have to stay a little longer because God is at work. But then notice what he says, and there are many adversaries. There's a revival taking place. People are getting saved. I need to stay here a little longer, not only because of that, but because also there are many adversaries. Anytime God begins to move, the enemy also mobilizes his troops and his resources to try to quench what God is doing. Now, we need to pay attention to the rest of chapter 4 because we're going to learn how he comes, his strategy, and we're going to see how God's people responded. There are always adversaries to the work of God. How many of you know that? Say amen. amen. Have you found that out in your own life? Yep, yep, yep. All right. Now, notice how the adversary came. The adversary had two strategies. The first one might surprise you. Verse 2. They came and knocked on their door and said, Oh, we hear you're rebuilding the temple of the Lord and you rebuilt the altar. That's wonderful. Let us build with you for we seek your God as we do. Sounds good, right? But it was a lie. We know it was a lie because in verse 1 the Bible says that these were adversaries. They were enemies. They were lying through their teeth. This is what we might call infiltration. Infiltration. The devil tries to get into the church, get into the people of God, get into the ministry so that he can destroy it from the inside. It's not unlike a virus, uh, a cold virus. You get exposed to that virus and maybe you touch something that, or you, you shake hands and, and the person was infected and, and the virus now is in your hand and then you, you scratch your face and, and somehow you touch your lips or you hold something and then you eat it or you scratch your eyes and the virus gets inside your body and now that it's inside your body, it's going to wreak havoc. It will start all kinds of bad things and your body's going to have to respond and react. 
This is how viruses work, and this is also how the devil works. He tries to get inside of you. I say this often, but it's, impo it's important enough that it bears repeating. An ocean liner or a, a boat, a ship, it can take waves and it can take storms and it can, it, it can get through storms and survive waves as long as water doesn't get inside the boat. The moment water starts getting inside, that's when you're in trouble. That was the trouble with the Titanic. The hole got breached and water started getting inside. As long as water is outside, the boat's going to be okay. It, it, might, it might even flip, but it won't sink. But when water gets inside, it's just a matter of time and it's going to sink. It's the same thing spiritually, folks. You can go through a storm and as long as the storm doesn't get inside of you, you can be in a, in a bad situation. You can be surrounded by, by sinners. You can be surrounded by sin. You can be surrounded by people who are angry, bitter, lustful, pride, proud. You can be surrounded by that as long as it gets, doesn't get inside of you. The moment it gets inside of you, it starts destroying you. And so here's what the adversary did. Let's get in. Let's find a way in. So they played nice. Hey, we come out, came over to help you. He didn't come to help. Beware. Beware of the enemy trying to infiltrate your life. Beware of the virus of sin trying to get inside of you. Beware of evil, satanic, demonic, secular influences trying to, to get a grip of your heart, get, a, get a, a foothold in your heart, in your mind. Because once it's inside, it begins to destroy you. Well... Here's what Zerubbabel said to them. You're not building with us. You're not really servants of Jehovah. You don't worship Jehovah. You're not committed to him. You haven't brought sacrifices. You haven't surrendered your life. You have no interest in this. No, you, you can't build with us. So they tried a second strategy. Verse 23. So they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews by force of arm. And by force of arms made them cease. Well... If they couldn't infiltrate, they would try to stop them by force. And this is what we might call outward hostility. If we, if we can't, the world, if the world can't get in and destroy the church from the inside, it will try to kill the church from the outside. It's, it declares open war to the church. I, I like the way uh, Jeshua and uh, Zerubbabel responded. They armed the, the workers and said, we're going to keep on working. And you're going to have your tools in one hand and your weapon in another. <laughs> so you just watch and pray. You're going to tool in one hand, weapon in another. And if it comes to a fight, we'll fight. But we're not going to stop what God has called us to do. Now this work would go on for several decades, literally several decades. They would finish the temple and then they went on to, to rebuild uh, the, the walls as well. And, uh, and throughout uh, uh, this time, there was great opposition. The struggle and opposition lasted for several decades. And the work was interrupted multiple, multiple times by political moves and military, military threats. And that's chapters 4, 5, 6, 7. But God raised leaders to point the people in the right direction and mobilize them to do the right thing. So this is going to go on now for about 40 or, or 50 years. And once in a while, uh, they would have to take a step back because there would be a, a letter from, from Babylon or from Persia saying, you have to stop building because we've got to look into some reports that we heard. It sounds like you guys are getting ready to rebel again, so stop everything. And they would have to stop. And then things would get cleared up and they start again. So this went back and forth and back and forth. You might suspect that along the process, people might get discouraged. After all, it's been 40 years and still not done. And you're right. Many people got discouraged. So God sent some reinforcements. Remember they're being led by Zerubbabel. Who is the civil leader. He's like the, the mayor. Mayor of, uh, of, of Jerusalem. And they're also being led by Jeshua. Who is the priest. He's like the pastor. So Jeshua and Zerubbabel are leading the people. But even Jerubba, Excuse me. Blah, blah, blah. Excuse me. Even Zerubbabel is getting a little weary. Even Zerubbabel is getting a little tired. The work is getting, uh, it's taking a toll on him. So God raises up, here they come again. We've talked about them in the past, the prophets. 
God raised up two specific prophets to encourage the leaders so that the leaders could lead and the congregation could get the job done. The two leaders that God raised up, the two prophets, are a man by the name of Haggai and a man by the name of Zechariah. And we will read and study their books and their ministry later on. But they came into action right at this time. Ezra 5 Verses 1 and 2. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem, and in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Notice, they began to build. Why did they begin? Hadn't they begun before? Yeah, they began, but got tired and stopped. They got discouraged. And God had to raise up prophets to say, come on, people, let's do this. We can do this. God is with us. And I'm, it's going to be exciting to go to the book of Haggai and Zechariah because there were some specific and, and really exciting prophecies. And uh, there was a prophecy for Zerubbabel that he really encouraged him. And we'll see all that in, in due time. But the point here for us to remember is that when we need encouragement, when we need correction, when we need direction, God raises up godly leadership. But even the leadership needs encouragers. So God will raise up prophets to call us to action, to challenge us, to put some fire under our feet. Thank God for the prophets. Haggai and Zechariah were just such men. May God raise up prophets among us as well, that we too may be challenged and encouraged, and that we too may accomplish the work God has called us to. Amen? Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6, I'm going to speed up here as we're, we're coming to the end of the book. Ezra chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. We're still talking about godly leadership. We're going to see now Haggai, Zechariah, Zerubbabel, and Jeshua working together. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. Let me pause here for a second. They prospered through the prophesying. Would you say that with me? They prospered through the prophesying. Let's say it again. They prospered through the prophesying. The Bible says that without divine revelation, without a word from God, people perish. We need men and women who will declare the word of God to us. And when we hear the word, we will prosper. We need the word. God spoke the world into existence through his word. I am encouraged that God raised up Haggai and Zechariah to prophesy and that people prospered under their prophesying. Oh, may God raise up prophets among us. May God raise up prophets in the Bay Area who will declare the word of God not only to us but to our community so that people will get saved and we will prosper in the work of the Lord. And they built and finished it. Would you say that with me? And they built and finished it. They finished it because they were encouraged through the prophetic ministry. All right. According to the commandment of God, the God of Israel, and according to the command of Cyrus, Dyrus, Art, and Artaxerxes. Try to say that with an accent. <clears throat> Interesting thing about Cyrus, Dyrus, and Artaxerxes. All three of them are pagan kings. None of them are God-fearing men, and yet God was using them to accomplish His purposes. The book of Proverbs says that the heart of the king is like a river being guided by the hand of God. Even without knowing, and sometimes even without intending, they are, uh, God uses them to accomplish, accomplish His purposes. Now, verse 15, the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. And if we take a secular calendar and secular history and figure that out, it comes out to March uh, of the year 515 before Christ. March 515, the temple was finished. We come now to chapter 7 very quickly. Now after these things, in other words, after the temple was rebuilt, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, a descendant of Aaron came to Israel, excuse me, came to Jerusalem. Verse 6, this Ezra came up from Babylon and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given 
The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So now after these things, Ezra comes. I, when is after these things? After these things in the reign of Artaxerxes is 60 years after the rebuilding of the temple. So between the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7, 60 years go by. The year now is 458 before Christ. And this is the time of Ezra. This is a second large group of Jews coming back from Babylon to Israel. The first came with Zerubbabel. The second, the second group is coming six year, uh, 60 years later with a man by the name of Ezra. Notice verse 10, uh, 7, 10, Ezra 7, 10, about Ezra. Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach it. I don't know about you, but I think that's, those are wonderful goals for life. Seek the will of God, do the will of God, teach the will of God. Seek the word of God, do the word of God, teach the word of God. I pray that God will help me do that, th that very thing in my own life. May I, may you, may us, may, may we always commit ourselves to seeking the will of God, doing the will of God, and then teaching the will of God. And that's the kind of person Ezra was. So he comes to Jerusalem 60 years later with a whole bunch of people. And there's a list of them mentioned in Scripture. And they come, uh, it's, a, it's a second group. And they're coming to repopulate Israel. Verse 28, 728. So uh, this is Ezra saying, uh, speaking. He says, So I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. Then we departed from the river Ahava, on the twelfth day of the first month to go back to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy. And from, the, from ambush along the road. Remember we talked about those 900 miles. Dangerous uh, and difficult road and dangerous spots. But the Lord kept them and they came back. Now these returning exiles were supposed to rebuild the wall in the city. The altar had been rebuilt already. The temple had been rebuilt already. Now they needed to rebuild the wall and the city. And that's what these, uh, these folks would be doing, led by Ezra. So that's their assignment. The problem, however, was that they were mixed with the culture of Babylon. They had been in Babylon for now over a hundred years. And they had been involved in pagan worship. Chapter 9, verses 1, 2, and 3. Real quick, Ezra 9. When these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands with respect to the ab abominations of the Canaanites. Verse 2. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in the trespass. He says, We've been, our people have become involved with the people of the land, and we have been corrupted by their customs. And we're worshiping their God. As a matter of fact, our leaders are the worst offenders. Our priests are the worst offenders. So when I heard this, this is Ezra talking, verse 3. So when I heard this, I tore my garments in my robe and I plucked out some of my hair, uh, the head of my hair, head, the hair of my head. I can't afford to do that, by the way, just to let you know. But he plucks his hair out, he throws his clothes off, and, and he sat down astonished. He was upset, he was discouraged. Here we are coming to rebuild the city and you guys are involved in pagan worship. Don't you realize that this is what got us here in the first place? This is what got our city destroyed? This is what got us into captivity? What are you guys doing? So they come together. They call for an assembly. And they pray and they fast and they ask God for guidance. Verse 14, Ezra 9, 14. Should we again break your commandments and join in marriages with people committing these abominations? And I just want to make one clarification here. Folks, the problem here was not interracial marriage. The problem here is not marrying someone who is of a different nationality or different ethnicity or different color of, of their skin. The problem here, verse 14. 
marriages with people committing abominations. The problem was that people were committing abominations and they were marrying into those families and then they, they were committing abominations themselves. It's what so uh, Solomon did, remember? The Bible is full, both in the Old and New Testament, of interracial marriages that had the blessing of God. Moses married interracially. Uh, J Joseph married interracially. And there were many others. The issue here is not interracial marriages. God does not oppose interracial marriages. I, I remember saying this once in church and people were shocked when I first said it. I said, uh, you might ask me if I believe in interracial marriages. And I said, no, I don't. Because you must marry someone of the human race. Stay in the human race. But there's only one race. There's only one race. It's the human race. And the color of your skin, the language you speak, that doesn't make you a different race, different culture, different ethnicity, but there's only one race, one human race. We're all sons and, and daughters of Adam and Eve. And so God blesses um, marriages of different ethnicity. That's never been a problem. But the problem, again, was getting involved with abominations, pagan gods, false worship. And, um, and God, and Ezra then led by the Holy Spirit, said, we've got to put an end to this. After prayer and confession, God's people met together and agreed that there was only one solution. Chapter 10, and this is the end of the book. This is how the book ends. And we'll pick up the story next Sunday when we come to Nehemiah. Nehemiah picks up the story right here. But here's how it ends in Ezra. It ends kind of abruptly. They're back in Jerusalem. They prayed and God has gave them a solution. And here's the solution. Verse 10 and 11. Ezra 10, 10 and 11. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore, number one, make confession to the Lord. Number two, do what is right, do His will. And number three, separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from your pagan wives. Folks, God is very pro-family. He created marriage and He established the family. However, God is also anti-sin. He opposes all that is wrong. All that is wrong. Matthew 10, verse 37 and 38 tells us this. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Ezra put it this way to them. He said, what you've done is wrong and you're adding to our transgression. The solution is going to be painful because the sin is serious. You need to break up this relationship. You need to break up this relationship. I'm not sure we take sin as serious as we need to in our day and age. We need to. God doesn't mess around with sin. Sin is a cancer. You can't put a band-aid on cancer. You can't counsel cancer. You can't take aspirin for cancer. Cancer calls for drastic, drastic measures. Sin calls for drastic measures. We need to take sin seriously. And if we are going to yield our lives to Christ, it means loving Him more than we love anything or anyone else. And here's what Jesus says, if you're not willing to do that, you're not worthy of Him. If you're not willing to forsake sin in order to follow Christ, you can't be a Christian. That's the plain truth. We may not like hearing it, but it's what the Word says. If you're living with someone without the benefit of marriage, and you want to serve Jesus, you need to make things right. You need to get married or you need to sever that relationship. There's, there's no two ways around it. There's, there's, 
There's no way to sugarcoat this. I know that the world is doing it. Everybody's doing it. Out there, but not in the kingdom. If you want to serve Jesus, you're going to have to say no to vice. You can't be fooling around with drugs and alcohol and serving Christ. You need to draw a line and say, no, I'm serving Jesus Christ now. I'm going to say no to this stuff. You can't be reading the Bible on, on Sunday and your horoscope on Monday. No, you can't do that. You can't be listening to preaching on Sunday and Oprah on Monday. It's, it's, it's not going to work. It's, it's two different kingdoms. It's, it's, it's a different set of values. You can't do both. You just can't do both. And you're going to have to decide. You can't do both. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and your boss and your job and yourself and your pleasures. And so Jesus says, if you come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And you need to make a decision today. Are you going to serve Christ or not? You can't serve Christ and Buddha. It's one or the other. You can't serve Christ and Confucius. It's one or the other. You can't believe creation and evolution. It's one or the other. It's the Bible or it's the world. And you do have a choice. But you've got to make that choice. You've got to make that choice. I can't make it for you. And God can, but He won't make it for you. He loves you and respects you that much that He's going to point you in the right direction and then wait for you to decide. I'm urging you to decide today, I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus. And if anything or anyone gets in my way, I'm sacrificing it or it or her or him and I'm following Jesus. May God help us to do that. So that's what they did in Ezra. They said, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. And let's say no to paganism and to the world. And that's what they did. Would you stand with me? I'm going to close with three quick thoughts as you stand. First of all, we rejoice that God allows second chances, so take it. God allows second chances, so take it. Number two, God allows second chances, but don't take it for granted. Don't leave here thinking, well, if God allows second chances, I'll come back tomorrow. I'll come back next Sunday. We don't know that there's a chance. Don't take it for granted. That may not be a tomorrow. Decide today. Make your, your decision today. Commit to Christ today. And then thirdly and finally, seek to know, to do, and to teach the will of God, even when it's painful. Even when it's painful. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And it cuts deeply. It cuts deeply, Lord, to expose sin. And to bring us to a decision. So today we come to that moment where we too must make a decision. Before we close the service, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the call of God in your life. God is saying, would you come now and surrender your life to me. So that you can do the work I have prepared for you. To build my kingdom. To build my temple. To establish worship at the altar. God is calling you. God is calling you to walk with Him, a relationship with Him. And I would be remiss to close the service without giving an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So I won't. I won't close it without it. I want to give you a moment right now as the church prays. If you are hearing the Word of God calling you, I want you to make a decision here and now. And you can do so by raising your right hand up and saying, I choose Jesus over anything and everything. Over anyone and everyone, I choose Jesus. I surrender all. I'm giving Him my life. I'm giving Him my heart. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else, raise your hand up. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for these who have raised their hands. You know who they are. And I pray right now, honor their decision, Father. Five hands have gone up. Father God, hold these hands, I pray. As they surrender to you, oh God, I ask you, Jesus. Confirm now, Lord your word in their hearts strengthen them Lord in their resolve and may this church be a nurturing place where they can grow spiritually Father touch them right now Holy Spirit touch them church pray with me right now that God would just touch those who have made a decision in the name of Jesus Father strengthen them Lord remove right now guilt from sin 
And give them a conviction of salvation of a relationship with you. Holy Spirit, begin to speak in their hearts right now. Pointing them in the right direction and helping them to make the decisions that will sever any and every commitment to the world and to sin. Help them make, Lord, the tough decisions in the name of Jesus. I want to pray for myself and I want to pray for you. I want to pray for this church. That we would be like Ezra. People who study, do, and teach the will of God. I want to be committed to those three things. I want to study the mind of God. The values of the kingdom. The principles of the kingdom. And I want to do them. And only then I want to teach them. First I need to know them. Secondly I need to put them in practice. And then maybe, maybe God will give me an opportunity to teach them. So let's, let's join right now in prayer. That God would make us a church. A Ezra church. A church that seeks the will of God, that does the will of God, and then that teaches the will of God. Heavenly Father, we are committing ourselves today as a church, as a ministry, and as a family. We're committing ourselves to seeking your will, doing your will, and then teaching it. This road will call us to sacrifice. It will call us to surrender. And sometimes it will be painful, even dangerous. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can and we will do it. Help us, we pray. And may we find strength and encouragement in fellowshipping with one another and pursuing these goals together. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in His name we thank you. May God's people shout, Amen Amen and Amen. Hallelujah! Oh, this was fun. God bless you. God loves you. I love you. Have a wonderful week. And we'll see you again tomorrow night for prayer. God bless you.